Well, hello there, and welcome to Leading Exercises That Don't Suck, How to Build Effective and Realistic Crisis Management, Information Security, and Continuity Exercises. My name is Brian Strauser. I'm the principal founder and CEO at a consulting firm based in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota, here in the United States called BrightPath. I have about 25 years of experience uh, in crisis management, corporate security, and business continuity. And what I want to talk about today is a little bit about how to, what we've learned over time about creating exercises that don't suck. How do you build exercises that are engaging and are interesting uh, for your stakeholders and participants and don't look like what you see here, which is a facilitator that's frustrated and participants that are asleep, that are simply not interested in what's going on. But I'd like to start with a little bit of humor. So here's an example of what bad PowerPoint might look like. Get it? Bad PowerPoint. All right, let's get on with the content. What we want is an exercise that doesn't look like this dude here on the right. We want an exercise that is interesting and engaging and gets you to the strategic objectives that you're trying to achieve in the course of the exercise. What we typically see with exercises when we're observing or when we're going into a company and talking about what their exercises look like are really kind of um, kind of kind of six issues that really come up. The first is that the exercise goals are just not aligned to what the organization really needs. There's not good alignment between what we're trying to accomplish in the exercise and what the organization is after. The second issue we see is that the exercise difficulty is a mismatch for the company. We often see exercises that are simply too simple, they're too easy for the company to do based on where they're at in their maturity of their crisis management, continuity, infosec processes, or they're so difficult, um, it's impossible for them to solve the issue. It's like in Star Trek, it's the Kobayashi Maru simulation where it's the no-win simulation. It's about how you deal with failure. But that's not what we're trying to do in a crisis exercise. We're trying to build confidence with that crisis management team, or we're trying to challenge them in order to help them understand kind of current uh, challenges and things that they may be faced with. So we want the right balance of simplicity and difficulty based upon where that company or organization is at. The third challenge that we see with exercises is that the exercise simply doesn't reflect reality. It's so far-fetched. It's such a foreign concept. It's so difficult to imagine that this scenario would happen that the participants just give up. They throw up their hands. and are like, well, this is just not realistic. And while we always try to tell people not to fight the scenario, um, when we're doing exercises, the challenge with this particular issue is that it's just not realistic and therefore your stakeholders and others are just not, just not buying into what's going on. The fourth challenge we see with exercises is stressors. Uh, we see that the exercise just doesn't induce the right level of stress with the participants. This is particularly true in mature organizations where we need to induce stress. We need to make the exercise more realistic. We need to force them down a path to make some difficult decisions. And in mature organizations, that's what we want the crisis team, the business continuity team, the infosec team to have to do. Uh, and so the, often we see exercises that, that just don't introduce the appropriate level of stress. Our fifth issue that we see with exercises is really around the siloed nature of how they've been put together, that the exercise is simply not structured well as a cross-functional exercise. A great example of this is a communications or reputation management a centered exercise that is only cross-functional at the very top of the organization when you get to the executive team or executive committee, operating committee, or the board. Um, whereas really, these, this should have been more of a cross-functional exercise from the very beginning, and all of the key players and leaders need to be at the table. And then lastly, exercises. We see a lot of exercises that don't have any accountability. So there's not an after-action report, or there's not a structured after-action process. There's a lack of direct feedback. There's a lack of accountability for what has gone on. There's a lack of action items that need to be followed up on. So these are kind of the, you know, to frame up the conversation, these are kind of the six 
things that we typically see with exercises that are just not doing well for the organization. And in a lot of cases, we see multiple factors like this as we look at what is going on there. So let's start by just talking about exercise goals. We believe that an exercise starts with well thought out uh, goals that are laid out and bought into by the executive stakeholders that are overseeing or sponsoring the exercise. Uh, or you know, perhaps it's something that's approved by a governance group if you have such committees in your organization. And you wouldn't have, in, in most cases, I think, probably wouldn't have more than uh, typically two to four exercise goals. But here's some examples that we typically use when we're planning an exercise. First, test our plans and our understanding of roles and responsibilities in a safe environment during a major disruption. So an exercise is a safe environment. It should not be a place where you're judging the performance of others. We're really looking at how are our processes and our plans, and we're going to test those or practice those. And we're going to learn from that interaction, and then we're going to work to improve that interaction. And are folks clear on their roles and responsibilities? Do we know what the plan calls for us to do? And that's really, I think, an important exercise goal. The second that we often use is, hey, this is about developing muscle memory for participants who have responsibility for incident and crisis management with our current plans and processes. So it's practice to build that muscle memory. It's practice because now that I've done it, likely in a harder environment, in an exercise, practicing in a safe environment, when it happens for real, I know what to do because I've done it. I, I'm comfortable with my checklist because I've used it. I'm comfortable drafting this communication from a template because I've done it. So the same reason that sports and athletic teams practice or that police have exercises for difficult situations, it's the same for this. We're going to practice this. We're going to build muscle memory. So when it happens for real, I'm going to know how to do it because I've done it. The third exercise goal we like to use is to practice the interplay between stakeholders and the incident response teams that would happen during a major disruption. If your exercise calls for something that would involve the attention of executives, and executives are not always in the room or not always part of your crisis team, um, or there's interplay between multiple incident response teams, as you see in large, complex organizations, this is an important goal and an important factor to include in your exercise. Imagine for a moment that you're in a large organization and you have a crisis team that's dealing with the moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day operational details that your company needs in an, uh, to have in a crisis response. But your executives have to sign off on certain things like probably reputational communication, um, probably a certain interaction with the federal government, for example. You have to practice that interplay. Who takes the message to them? What's the approval process? What if they don't get back in a timely manner? How is communication approved? All of that interplay between teams or between rooms, for example, needs to be practiced in the context of an exercise so that you know whether or not it's going to work. And you need the muscle memory to be able to do that. The fourth exercise goal uh, that we recommend is about building relationships and collaboration with each other. A lot of times uh, silos just don't interact particularly in critical moments and challenging moments. And so this is something we want to practice in an exercise. Uh, what does that interaction look like? What do those relationships look like? Uh, what's that collaboration start to look like? And then lastly, you may have an optional goal about following up on issues previously identified in an exercise or perhaps a real-life incident that's happened recently. Uh, maybe you mentioned some specific issues, but usually it's, hey, we want to follow up on the after-action report from the exercise we did. A year ago. When we think about building exercises, we really think about a life cycle of exercises that crosses a year or two um, where we're doing building blocks. We're starting with kind of the lowest level of operational exercise and we're building upon that as a part of a cohesive exercise strategy. And here's a way to lay that out just kind of simply. And we're going to go from the bottom up. We really think about drills as being that entry level to the exercise world. They're usually tactical. They're usually execution focused. You're usually focused, they're, they're, they're short in duration, and you're usually focused on really one goal. So for example, if you have a global security operations center 
And one of the things that they might be responsible for is convening the crisis management team by sending an emergency notification and kicking off the conference call uh, and taking role or something like that. Then practice that twice a year, three times a year, four times a year. Start with scheduled drills and then make them unannounced drills and have them do that. Have them send the message at three o'clock in the morning. Get the crisis team together. Um, so shall you practice, so shall you live. And so we start with that basic drill building block. From there, your next level is really facilitated tabletops. So this is, you know, I would think about this as a, you've got a crisis, you've got a strong exercise facilitator that's facilitating the discussion. Um, it could be something along the lines of a plan walkthrough. These are generally low stress. They're, I would center them on a scenario. Um, I would use these to build confidence in roles and responsibilities with a plan. Um, this is not a uh, something that you want to make into a super complex, super difficult situation. But let's take a natural, let's take a tornado that has impacted uh, a facility and we've got partial facility loss for the time being and then work, them, work the team through their initial response and then the invocation of their business continuity plan. And they just talk through it. You give them some moves. And this kind of updates to the situation. They have the plan in front of them. They've got their leadership team with them. They open it up and they're like, okay, well, I've, I've, if we've lost the building and I can't work there, then I can move 40 people uh, to remote work. They can go home with their laptops. So they get their laptops, they go home. And we execute this portion of our plan. And you're just talking through this in a facilitated tabletop. Again, this is a, I see this as a confidence builder, plan familiarization. That's really what we're driving here. The next level of exercise is a, is a lightweight simulation. Um, this is called uh, an integrated exercise or some other thing is if you, if you go to the FEMA uh, guidance, FEMA DHS guidance on exercises. But here we're talking about, okay, now we're going to simulate this. We're going to fully simulate some portions of it. We're not going to fully simulate all of the activities that we're supposed to do. For example, in a data breach exercise that you would put in the lightweight simulation, um, we're going to have everybody in the room or on the bridge. We're going to talk about the, you know, the data breach that has happened. We're going to give them inserts and injects that move the conversation forward. And there's elements of this that they're going to practice, maybe drafting some communication and that kind of thing. The full simulation is you're going to do it for real. Um, if it calls for remote work, then you're going to send people on remote work from their primary work site. If it calls for drafting all team communication, then you're going to draft that and move it through the approval process. So again, this is a building block. You're going to, you get to this level of exercise over time. You want to move from simple and tactical to complex and strategic, but this is kind of how we think about that annual or biannual life cycle of exercises. Let's talk about what this looks like for real. And we're going to use a case study uh, about one of our clients, a healthcare technology firm uh, that is a large, complex organization that operates in multiple countries, just for perspective. So in their uh, structure for crisis management in a data breach, which is the example that we're going to use, uh, they kind of have three levels of response based upon severity. Um, all data breach events really start with a detection by a security incident response team. This is an InfoSec engineering team that's really looking at the issue and investigating it and determining a severity level and taking all the right tactical steps and then making the teams aware above them uh, when the incident has reached a certain severity, when they suspect that data has been disclosed or when they um, have determined for sure that data has been wrongfully accessed or exposed. Their middle level of response is um, a cross-functional group called the Data Incident Response Group. There are subject matter experts from across the organization who are specifically charged with managing the response to a data exposure or data breach. And then lastly, there is a cross-organizational crisis management team and an executive leadership team, and their job is to make the strategic decisions for the organization. They are connected by having representation uh, across the three teams in the Data Incident Response Group, and then uh, certainly the executives would deal with certain things that are escalated to them. Their previous exercise strategy uh, that was used prior to our involvement was singularly focused on identifying that there had been an unauthorized exposure. So we're going to find that there's an exposure. And now that we've found that there's an exposure, 
We're going to write all the messaging that needs to happen for their third-party notification provider, an outside company that was going to handle the data breach notification and service issues associated with that, like um, um, you know, identity protection uh, monitoring, uh, credit monitoring, uh, dealing with the cleanup from exposure of personal health or personal um, personally identifiable information and the things that we see all the time in these incidents. And that was their exercise strategy. We're going to identify that this has happened. We're going to write the messaging and now we're done. So what's missing here? Well, there's a lot of things missing like the rest of the plan. Um, like exercising the third party notification provider. Can they actually do the things that they say they're going to do? Uh, what about the rest of the plan? We've got to notify people. We've got actions to take. We've got to mitigate the uh, exposure. We've got to make sure that the enemy has uh, the uh, the unauthorized intruder into the systems has been expelled uh, from the systems that the systems have been secured. And you can just imagine the list goes on. So as we think about this and how to structure this in our way, um, you know, kind of our first step was to make sure that the exercise was centered on the plan. So we want to take the plan from start to finish in the course of that exercise strategy, that building block exercise strategy, so that we're covering all of the different things that need to happen during the course of that exercise life cycle. So again, we look at this structure and we ask ourselves, well, what can we test in line with the exercise objectives and things that we've seen previously that are not always done well in exercises. Well, there were a few things that came to mind. We can test the CERT team's internal processes for detecting, triaging, and escalating an incident, right? The technical elements, of course, are part of what we could look at, but the most important thing from our standpoint with this plan is once they've determined that they're at that severity level where others need to be involved, what does that escalation look like, and can we test that? So we can test how they escalate and communicate to the data incident response group or team. We can test and exercise the assembly of the, that team together and what that initial briefing from the CERT team looks like. We can assess how communication flows between the data incident response team and their senior executives in the board. We can assess how they write messaging with around public exposure and disclosure of the incident. And we can assess the interplay with the third party notification provider by having them participate in the exercise. So these were six things that we came up with just thinking about, you know, what are the pressure points that we could test, what we could exercise and see how they go. And also allow the team to build confidence and muscle memory in this process. Another thing that we believe strongly in, in exercises when you get to the partial and full simulation level is that the person that's going to be leading the incident, you call them an incident coordinator or incident commander, incident leader, the title doesn't matter, the role is what's important, but have them lead the process. Have them lead the process the way they would if it was real. And you can assess, can they lead it? Are they following the plan? Are they leading through the checklist? How do they deal with disruptions to that plan? But we want to see them lead. And again, this is not necessarily about evaluating them, but does the process work? Does the role work with the right roles and responsibilities, checklists and tools in place? Another thing that we look at a lot in exercises as teams start to build confidence and we get further up that building block scale and we start talking about facilitated exercise, we start talking about rather um, uh, simulations, uh, partial and full, then we want to think about ways to ramp up the stress in this exercise. And so one thing that's worked well for us is to have telephones in the exercise room placed at different stations and have phone calls come in as opposed to text-based inserts or injects into the exercise that are put up on the screen or handed to somebody in writing. We want to induce stress. And you can't escape the decision-making you know, for example, if you're a communications uh, representative on a crisis team, the phone rings and there's a reporter on the other end of the call, or in this case, an actor or actress pretending to be a reporter. But in doing so, we create a more realistic environment because that's what, hap is, that's what happens in real life. And they can then, then, if you think about the exercise from there, they could answer the question in a way that results in a positive press story or in some cases, no press story. Or they could answer the question in a way 
that results in a negative press story. For example, by just ignoring the reporter saying, I'm going to get back to you and never get back to them, that have consequences in place for those poor decisions. The other area that we believe you should ramp up over time as the team gains more confidence and you get into more simulations, and that is to make a communication realistic. The ways that these teams communicate in real life, SMS, email, Slack, or Microsoft Teams, phone calls, Twitter, or other tools that are out there, make the communication realistic. Have communication come in through multiple channels the way that it does in real life and force the team to deal with what they with that communication as it comes in. So for example, in information security exercises, we always use an email communication uh, from Brian Krebs. Brian Krebs is an information security blogger uh, who writes at Krebs on security. Uh, he is probably the leading InfoSec journalist from our opinion. Um, and has his own you know, kind of operation, is very well connected to what's going on around the world. We always have Krebs, um, our fake Krebs here, uh, have an email from Krebs sent to the communications team at a client during an exercise. And this is really an email that just comes into their general media email that they're monitoring. This says, hey, it's Brian Krebs. I'm calling to talk about a recent data breach that I believe has happened to your organization. I have found a number of pieces of evidence that leads back to an unsecured Amazon S3 bucket with PII data that's from your clients. Please give me a call at blah, 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 blah. So this email comes in. Now, the, the company has already assembled their data incident response team in their exercise, and they're dealing with this. And, of course, there's the big question, when do we have to go public and what is our messaging? And then this comes in. So the comms team can ignore it. In which case, in the exercise, there would be a negative story from Krebs. They could put him off and then never get back to him, in which case there's a negative story from Krebs. Or they could decide to go public early and they fill him in on what's going on, and then he breaks the story. So there's a lot of, you know, you got to think about how does the scenario branch as you make these communications. But this is real. This is how um, reporters will send in communication or they'll send emails or they'll call looking for statements, and that should influence the exercise. And again, as I said, actions should have consequences. Positive actions doing the right thing, there should be positive consequences. Uh, negative actions, which unfortunately is what usually happens with this email, well, there should be negative press coverage. But that's real life. That's what happens in one of these real situations. Another major factor with exercises is to involve the C-suite as appropriate. Um, they should not be exempt from exercises. They certainly can throw a wrench or a differing opinion in an exercise. But if, all, if decisions in some of these scenarios that we use for exercises in the company that's exercising ultimately get to the C-suite for decisions or even just for information, then they should be involved in the exercise so that they get used to how this information flow works. In the scenario that we were discussing here, with a healthcare technology client, they have one or two executives that are in the exercise that are the decision makers, ultimate decision makers and approvers of communication. And it's their role to keep the other executives informed. And so there's ways and methods that that can be exercised uh, during the exercise. Integrating third-party providers that are a part of the solution for these situations should also be a part of the exercise. For example, in this data breach scenario, you think about the third-party providers that may be at the table. There's a third-party breach notification service that needs to be there. There's outside counsel that's part of the data breach response. There's an outside crisis communications firm that's part of the data breach response. There might be even more. All of those over time should be tested in your exercise strategy to make sure that they can deliver the services that they've contracted with you to do, but also that that interplay with them has played out. And particularly with, for example, outside PR firm and outside legal counsel, they may have great insight based upon their experience in dealing with similar situations on how to influence your plan and your approach that will make it more successful. Then there's the hot wash, the immediate after action discussion that should occur right after the exercise ends and while memories are fresh. And we, we like to take a two-part approach to just gathering feedback from the exercise. The first is indeed the hot wash. It's call it 30 minutes with the crisis team that you've been exercising with right after the exercise is over. 
and really just drill into, hey, what'd you see here today? And then get people to answer the questions as, here's things I saw that I liked. Like we did this really well uh, and capture that. Here's the things I saw where we struggled. Like this just didn't, this didn't feel good. This didn't look good or hey, this just didn't work. And then lastly, what do you want to do differently next time? What are the real action takeaways that you want to capture? Do that at a high level for 20 to 30 minutes when the exercise is over. Take con uh, contemporary notes as you're going through this. Capture that information for your after action report. And then we like to see a post-exercise survey sent the next day. We want to capture, we're going to ask the same three questions. Again, kind of free form. What did you see? What didn't you see? Or what were opportunities here? How can we be better next time? I think you also want to capture some questions along the lines of, hey, what, what did you bring to the exercise? How did you prepare for the exercise? And, and you can make these, you can fill some of these in and then leave some free form. Um, and then you, we like to ask questions like, on a scale of one to five, how well prepared do you think the organization is for the, the type of situation you saw? What are some future exercise scenarios you would like to see? What additional training do you believe that you or the crisis team or whatever the name of the team is, what are what's some additional training you think you need? Do you have any other feedback on the exercise? And so you're getting a good mix of objective and subjective and then using that to kind of influence your after action report. And then lastly, we like a solidly written plain English after action report that can be used to improve the organization strategy after the exercise is concluded. We like to see this written in two areas. Um, we like to start with uh, observations, and these are just clear factual statements of what happened and what was observed. Generally, no opinions here, no action items, just what happened. Second section are recommendations or action items. What are the clear actions that the organization should take based upon what was observed during the exercise. And even if you want to lay these down like side by side, you know, with ta in a table, observation, observations, recommendations, observations, recommendations. And, and so you have that kind of clear connectivity between observation and recommendation that works well too. And then lastly, uh, management should respond. Uh, there should be a single owner of that management response and they should have the prioritized action items and deliverable dates uh, based upon what's been recommended. Management can also add things. Management can also say, hey, we know this is a problem, uh, but we simply cannot address it at this time, and that's okay. So there's a few thoughts on building and leading exercises that don't suck. If we can help you in any way here at Bright Path with developing and designing and executing an exercise strategy, or even coming in and just taking a look at what you're doing and offering some advice, we work with a number of Fortune 500 organizations public sector agencies, and nonprofit organizations globally, we would love the opportunity to talk with you about your challenge. You can reach me at brian.strauser at brightpath.com or via phone at 612-235-6435 uh, and read more about our services and case studies and results that we've been able to deliver for our clients at brightpath.com. And don't forget to look for our podcast series Managing Uncertainty, which comes out every Monday and Thursday each week. Thanks for your time today listening to this uh, webinar presentation. I hope to hear from you.